and we are recording and this is live and everybody looks fabulous and our room is filling up. If you are here for the book launch of the very beautiful Belief Detective with Heather Lang and Jana Christie and Dr. Lauman, Dr. Meg Lauman, then you are in the right place. Um, We're gonna get started in a second. I'm just gonna let this room populate because believe it or not, there are over 100 people signed up to join us for this event today. Um, So this is a really big deal. Um, So just one of the things that I love to do just to get things started as rooms fill up is to talk about backgrounds. And so I see beautiful books behind you, Heather. Um, Can you tell me a little bit about just like what's in your background and on your, just what like what's on your bookshelf? Okay, well, behind me, I have, you can see my other picture book biographies that have come out. And basically, I'm in my office, and it's filled with children's books. I took all the other books out years ago, and the shelves are filled with all my children's books from authors and illustrators that I love. So that's where I am. I surround myself with books every day. That's awesome. I see there's a puppy in the background, too. Who's the puppy? Oh, that's my puppy, Vivi. Hopefully she won't interfere today, but um, she's, yeah, a little white, fluffy, adorable little puppy. Well, she's not a puppy anymore. And we're about to get another one, so. No kidding. Yeah. Wow. Good for you. (laughs) Jenna, what's behind you? Oh, uh, I'm in my workshop. Um, I also, along with illustrating, I make dolls and stuff, but (gasps) I've got, I've got, um, uh, photograph of my grandmother in her wedding dress and, and a painting and some art that I did and a embroidery piece that my um my stepmom did and then just got lots just boxes and vases filled with dried flowers and sticks and stuff. That sounds like a really inspiring space. That's wonderful. <laughs> I, I love illustrator spaces. I just think they're the best. That's <laughs> That's phenomenal. This and and Dr. Clean, this is like the clean corner. <laughs> no, that's a thing. Yes, I know. I'm in the clean corner of my space too. And it's not even, I know all about that. Yes. <laughs> Dr. Lemon, what's behind you? So behind me is the Amazon jungle. This, I am actually, it's a green screen, of course, and I'm standing on platform six, which is where Heather and I stood for the picture that's in the book of the Hi, author and the, and the subject. And of course, she and her husband came with me to this site and I have spent 25 years at this site. So it's a beautiful, amazing rainforest. And I wish we could all go there. It's so beautiful anyway, and it's disappearing fast. So that's why this book is so important, of course. And I do have a puppy under my feet, so I hope he behaves because he's only (laughs) nine weeks old. But like Heather, we just have to do what we do in this COVID, don't we? Getting crazy (laughs) new friends and things to do. (laughs) Yes, and it's Zoom, so we can't expect the puppies to all behave. And it's totally okay if there's there's a bark or two. It just means that there's life in the background. That's a good and joyful thing. I um, exiled my dog to another room because she she will go crazy and disrupt everything. So hopefully, hopefully we won't hear her in the distance. <laughs> It'll be totally okay if we do. That's <laughs> awesome. Oh, this is wonderful. So there are 71 people here to celebrate your brand new book, Heather. So congratulations. Um, I want to go on ahead and just get us started. So uh, friends, hi. Uh, can y'all see me? I hope that you can see me. Um, I'm going to just switch myself to spotlight. Can I do that? That would be me. Hi. Hi. My name is Kara Wilson-Cook. I am the events coordinator for the Silver Unicorn Bookstore, beaming into you today from Acton, Massachusetts. I am here with Heather Lang, who is the author of this brand new, gorgeous, nonfiction picture book that we are celebrating the launch of today, The Leaf Detective, How Margaret Lauman uh, Uncovered the Secrets in the rainforest. And this is a really beautiful and special book. Congratulations, Heather, on the launch of this brand new book. And thank you so much for choosing the Silver Unicorn for the launch today. Thank you. Yes, we're just so excited for you. Okay, so now what I'm gonna do is I'm going to uh, take myself off the spotlight. So get off of that. Okay, very good. 
And so what we're gonna do today is a couple of things. And I'm gonna start with some questions, but I, I want you all, you all in the audience to know that this book is available at silverunicornbooks.com. And if you want signed copies of this book, they are available to you at silverunicornbooks.com. So go on ahead and uh, go to the website and make sure that you specify in the comment section before checkout that you would like your book signed. You should also know that we are accepting donations to the Tree Foundation, which is Dr. Lauman's foundation that she'll be talking about um, in a little bit of signed copies of this book. So if you would like to purchase a donation copy of this book, you may also specify that at silverunicornbooks.com when you check out. That's all of my spiel. Um, so I'm going to start with some questions, if that's okay. Um, so the first, of course, goes to Heather, because today is about celebrating you and the birth of your book. So what inspired you to write The Leaf Detective? Well, when I write um, a picture book biography, I always have to have a strong connection to the person I'm writing about and also the topic. And I'm very concerned about what's happening to our natural world, especially our rainforests, which they're disappearing at an alarming rate. Um, so I knew I wanted to write a picture book biography that was also a science book about trees and the rainforest. And then when I read about Meg's pioneering work, exploring tree canopies and saving rainforests, I knew I'd found the perfect person to write about. I, I was struck immediately by her persistence, her determination, her resourcefulness, and of course her deep love for trees and the rainforest. And so, and I was lucky enough as Meg said earlier to go on a trip to the Amazon with her and learn from her first hand. So along the way, this turned into one of those special books that, you know, comes from the heart. And it's really just been such an honor to write about Meg's journey and to celebrate trees with the book. That's awesome. I, that is just so special. There is just so much to dig into. Um, I, uh, our illustrator, so Jana Christa, Christie is the illustrator of this book. And my question for you is what did you think when you read the manuscript for The Leaf Detective? And <laughs> why did you say yes to illustrating oh this God. book? It was, it was a dream assignment for me. It, it just, I've been waiting. I've been an illustrator for about 20 years and I've done many books that I really love and I've been attached to. But I have been wanting to do a book about the natural world for years and years and years. So when this came to me, I literally <laughs> jumped and screamed. <laughs> I think I got back to the publisher within about 10 seconds <laughs> saying, absolutely sign me up. I would love to be a part of this project. And learning about Meg's um, life and her journey, it's just, amazing and inspiring and uh just an absolutely beautiful beautiful thing that I wanted to be a part of so I was very excited that's awesome this is so, so special. this is the best yeah, <laughs> this is the best best um and and Dr. Lauman uh Meg Lauman the Meg Lauman this is such a big deal to have you know the subject of the book with us during the launch thank you so much for joining us um what messages are you hoping that young readers will come away with from your story oh sure well thanks to Heather and Jana I think messages can come away it is such a fabulous book I'm just overwhelmed and humbled the messages I hope to give to kids would be one that girls or boys can do anything they dream of doing even if they come from a small town even if they don't have some huge advantages along the way that you just need to dream and do um, and number two that our rainforests are in peril we need to really work on that and number three there is so much to explore Rainforest Canopies is one where there is just so much left to do and probably the kids of tomorrow will find new arenas of discovery and it will be fun to see how this book might give them that kind of toolkit to think about it. This is phenomenal. This is so great. I know that y'all have so much more to talk about. I will disappear in a second. I just wanna remind the audience um, that this is a Zoom webinar for your safety and for ours. However, if you have questions for any of uh, this special team 
who created this special awesome book, um, please drop them into the Q&A, which should be available to you. You can do that anytime. And I will be back um, toward the end of our hour um, to help facilitate those questions. Um, in the meantime, just congratulations again and again to all three of you for this wonderful, beautiful book. Um, and this is going to be such a special event. And we're just so excited for you. Congratulations on this launch. Thank you. Thank you. Thank All right, you. I'm going to disappear now. Have fun, y'all. All right. <laughs> On that note, I think we're going to start by reading the book. Um, and you'll see, I'm going to share my screen so you can enjoy Jana's gorgeous art. You will see that I've also got leaf facts. These are facts about the rainforest and trees that are sprinkled throughout the book. I'm not going to read those today because it would take too much time. So, but you could maybe look at those later if you do get a copy of the book. And also sprinkled throughout the book are quotes from Meg. <laughs> and um, I decided to include those because Meg has such a beautiful way of expressing herself, so powerful. And I wanted her to help tell her own story. So lucky for us today, we have Meg here to read her own quotes. <laughs> so I'm gonna share my screen now so you guys can enjoy the, the art in the book as well. Let's see. Hopefully everyone can see that. All right, here we go. The Leaf Detective, how Margaret Lauman uncovered secrets in the rainforest. We are part of our ecosystem, not outside it. Meg loved how leaves burst into the world and unfurled. She admired their different shapes, colors, and textures. After 20 years of thinking about them, reading about them, studying them, Meg wanted to understand them, to discover their stories. How did they survive? How long did they live? Why did they die? But looking at leaves from the ground gets a rainforest scientist only so far. Meg knew she had to find a way to go to the leaves, to the treetops. We had already been to the moon and back and nobody had been to the top of a tree. Meg Lauman had been a leaf detective ever since she was a young girl in the 1950s in Elmira, New York. Shy and studious, Meg rarely spoke in school. It pained me if I was ever called upon in class. Instead, she found comfort and friendship and quiet excitement in plants. She built tree forts and collected twigs, leaves, and wildflowers to study and identify, to press and label. Swamp thistle, devil's paintbrush, forget-me-nots. I was literally the only one in my town like myself. Meg wrapped herself in nature like a soft blanket. In college, Meg fed her passion with science. She was a young woman in a jungle of men with no women to lead the way. One professor refused to let her in his class because she was a woman. Still, she stuck like sap to her passion and followed it to graduate school in the tropical rainforests of Australia. No one at Sydney University had studied the rainforest before. In the dark, damp forest, the trees rose up to distant rustling, squawks and screeches, shadows in the treetops. How could she get up there? Using seatbelt straps, Meg sewed a harness. From a metal rod, she welded a slingshot. Pull, aim, release, fire. Meg launched a lead weight on a line again and again until at last it caught around the sturdy branch of a coachwood tree. At first, Meg flailed upside down, right side up. The steamy forest painted her with a coat of sweat. Swinging and twisting, she dangled like a worm on a hook. I was frozen with fear. 
Meg inched up the rope, but she worried. What if the branch breaks? Will my sewing hold up? Will a bird pack through my rope? What sits waiting in the treetops? At last, splashed with flowers and sunlight, the canopy, the treetop swayed back and forth. Flies whizzed, lizards lingered. A black weevil sucked leaf juices. Sweat bees landed on her arm for a lick of salt. And the jungle's music danced all around her. From then on, I never looked back or down. To Meg, it was a secret world with brilliant parrots and sleepy koalas, slithering pythons and busy ants. And leaves, lovely leaves, large and small, shiny and prickly, tender and tough. To scientists, it was a new frontier, mysterious and unexplored. Many people in Australia didn't understand Meg. They thought the rainforests were dark and gloomy and full of snakes. They wanted to cut them all down. You can't do this, people said. You're a woman. Women don't climb trees. Meg ignored them. Rainforest mysteries called her to climb and discover. She climbed the red cedar, the Antarctic beach, the sassafras. She explored the stinging tree. It defended itself. Its pincushion leaves tore at her skin and chemical hairs injected poisons with a fiery sting. Trees can't run away from their enemies like animals can. So instead they have to make a lot of defenses, thorns, fuzzy leaves, toxins. On each tree, Meg numbered leaves on different branches at different heights. She monitored and traced them to find out how long they lived. Hour after hour, day after day, she worked alone in the treetops. I found these times alone to be very strengthening as they encouraged me to develop confidence in myself. With each new climb, Meg discovered nibbled edges lacy skeletons and leaves that vanished quick as a snake's prey. She wondered what is eating all these leaves. One night outside her tent, Meg heard sounds. In the darkness, she crept into the forest. Noises swarmed around her, munching, crunching, chewing. With her headlamp, Meg scanned the leaves of a coachwood tree and discovered walking sticks and beetles feasting. To my amazement and delight, most herbivores fed at night. To insects, a tree is not just a tree. It is a salad bar, all you can eat leaves. To birds and mammals, a tree is a buffet, juicy fruits and plump beetles, salamanders and frogs. A tree is a sponge soaking up water from the forest floor and a recycler giving water back to the clouds, ready to quench another day's thirst. Meg tried to climb at night, but dangling from a rope studying leaves is difficult and dangerous in a dark forest with deadly snakes and spiders and ravenous biting ants. She had to find a better way. She brainstormed with other scientists. She thought and imagined, what if I fly up in a balloon or work from the edges of hillsides or train a monkey? Then one night at one of her research sites, she and a friend had a brilliant idea, a trail through the treetops made with ladders instead of ropes. They sketched the plan on a napkin. Meg helped invent the world's first canopy walkway. Now she could research day and night in good weather and stormy, alone and with others. Meg loved to give tours on the canopy walkway. Now Australian people wanted to visit their rainforest.
Meg returned to the United States and designed more walkways. She experimented with other ways to explore forest canopies. In Cameroon, Africa, she joined a team of scientists who launched a hot air balloon that placed a raft on the treetops. Meg couldn't wait to stand on top of the canopy. She had never been there before. In the sweltering heat, Meg struggled up the rope through the forest's understory. She wondered what sits waiting on the treetops. The heat drained her energy and she drained her water bottles. The climb seemed never ending. At last, Meg reached the treetops and climbed up through a hole onto the raft. Spread out before her as far as she could see, trees, trees, beautiful trees, millions of years in the making, filled with life, giving life. But it struck her, what good is my research for the trees, for the animals, for people, when the chainsaws are coming? If we do not conserve rainforests, all of our data will reference extinct organisms or sites that used to be. To some people, a tree is just a tree, good for timber or rubber or paper. To others, it is just a tree taking up land they could use to raise cattle and grow coffee or soybeans. Back in the United States, as she wrote up her research, Meg worried about the trees. She wondered, how can one leaf detective make a difference? How can I save the trees? I must save the trees. Then an idea crawled into Meg's thoughts, a way to speak for the trees. Plants gave me a voice. Meg traveled back to Cameroon and spoke to the villagers about the gifts their rainforest had to offer. She taught them to climb trees and survey the forests to identify and collect orchids and ferns. Now they could sell crops and plants instead of trees. Meg took her battle to other countries. In Western Samoa, she convinced the people to build a canopy walkway now they could make money to build a school by sharing their rainforests with the world through canopy tourism. In Ethiopia, Meg persuaded the people to gather rocks from their fields and build stone walls to protect their last lonely patches of trees. Now, first and foremost, I ask, how can we save it? So that later I can return and ask what and why. Meg used her voice to inspire people to save their rainforests, to save themselves. Because to Meg, a tree is not just a tree. It is a shelter for animals and people, a recycler and provider of water, a creator of food and oxygen, an inventor of medicine, a soldier against climate change. It is essential for life on earth. If only I could have achieved as much as the tree, but I have not. I have whittled away at relatively small goals in comparison to the grander accomplishments of a tree. And that's the end. So I'm gonna just show you the back matter briefly. This is, uh, there's an author's note where you can learn more about Meg's work and about our trip to the Amazon. And in the corner down here, you'll see the picture of Meg, a picture of um, the two of us when we were in the Amazon together. That's my favorite picture. And then there's this amazing spread. I don't know how Jana did it, but it's a cross section of the rainforest with labeled animals and plants. And also it shares what the different, each layer and what each layer does and how they all work together in, in the rainforest. And that's it. So 
I that was so fun, Meg, reading that with you. It was great. It was so, I loved it. it was so cool. We'll have to go on the road and do all the <laughs> gardens around the country. It was really neat. And I wanted to ask you just a few questions I thought people might be interested in. When I was researching the book, one of the things that really struck me was how plants shaped you and trees shaped you and how you evolved from this quiet, nature-loving child without a single female mentor. So I thought maybe you could talk a little bit about that. Sure. I just did love plants. And I think a lot of that had to do with being shy in a rural town. It was always wonderful to go into the woods and collect wildflowers or climb trees with a couple of my girlfriends that were patient with me. <laughs> um, and um, in retrospect, you know, I think more outgoing people probably study primates or dolphins and they're much more charismatic. So in some ways I probably picked a hard thing to market and um, try to fundraise for. But on the other hand, trees are that absolute brick and pillar of all ecosystems and all life on earth. So I do think plants are important and it is great to try to make a voice for plants and try to figure out ways to make plants the most exciting group of critters on the earth. And I'm still trying to work that one out, but your book will help a lot, I think. <laughs> I love some of the stories you told about how you were shy and how when you were in graduate school, you, you had to force yourself to speak in public and, and look at you now. It's, do you want to share one of those stories? Sure. I did mention to you, I guess, that when I started graduate school at Duke University, I literally used to throw up in the girls' room before I had to give a presentation. One professor required us to give these pretty major oral reports, and it just horrified me. And so I always was that person that did not raise my hand volunteering for anything like that. Um, at the end of the day, I finally taught ecology in Sydney for blue collar workers. I went in and did this kind of night school thing for factory workers. And I taught over and over and over till I wasn't scared out of my wits to walk into that classroom. And of course the people were wonderful and so nice and friendly, but it just took me a long time to overcome that fear of the public eye. But that's, it's just such a good lesson. It just shows you how, I mean, for all of us, I think practice, 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 yes. right? You true. just have to keep working at it and practicing. Yeah, absolutely true. Um, can you also talk a little bit about your research toolkit? Sure. Uh, it is crazy. I tell students that I probably spent 50% of my time developing the tools for canopy science because it was so new. And then the other 50% of the time actually doing the research, which is quite different from most sciences where a lot of the tools have already been developed even hundreds of years ago in some cases, such as you know microscopes or the periodic table or something like that. Uh, so it's been fun for the most part though, thinking of these ways to get into trees. And I really did want to train a monkey at the beginning, but unfortunately they weren't native to Australia. So my advisor forbid me to import them. Uh, the canopy walkway was fun. The hot air balloon was totally the most fun. And the other one, if we had about a million dollars in a budget, which we rarely did was a construction crane uh, and about 10 of those exist around the world now but that is a big limitation to field biology is the fact that the budgets are relatively small compared to perhaps physics or outer space exploration and we're still struggling to make rainforests a priority for government budgets and scientific budgets because the need is becoming more and more critical. And I loved the, the slingshot story when, when you told it to me the first time, I was like, you want to talk about that? Sure. About it's so happening? simple, isn't it? A little slingshot, you know, <laughs> and uh, I did have to make my first one. They were essentially illegal in Australia, which was quite hilarious because you could buy a shotgun just about anywhere, it seemed, at least out in the rural parts of the country. But I, when I did get a, finally an official and real slingshot, one that I didn't make myself, I had to get a permit for it from the police and keep it in a locked drawer, which was quite hilarious. But it was fabulous. It made me very popular with all the male graduates students um, who were very much of course in the majority so that was kind of fun people suddenly wanted to come on my field trips and help me out because they wanted to work my slingshot <laughs> <laughs> that's great 
Well, do you have any show and tell for us? Where you, well, you I do. Us? I actually have us one of the real, like these are the slingshots you buy in hunting outfitters in America. This was the one that got mailed to me that caused me so much trouble because I then had to go and get a permit. It was so much better though than the one I made myself. So it's really fantastic. And I love it, of course. Um, I do have just as a safety precaution for kids, but Climbing is like bicycling. It is a sport. So if you do technical climbing, you need a harness and safety gear, which is really important. Um, I have this cute little harness, which is what my boys wore when they were pretty little, age, say, six and seven. I think they got their first harnesses to come to work with mom. Uh, they kind of had to because I was a single parent. So anyway, it's always fun to see. And these, of course, are much better than the ones I made myself in Australia. This he has a beautiful little kind of cushion for your butt on the back. <laughs> so nowadays you can get fabulous harnesses if you are so interested in getting some tree gear. And I loved your other, your food piece of the research toolkit. The one thing you couldn't go without. Oh, that's true. And I don't have any now. I've eaten them all, I think, in the house. Oreo cookies saved my life <laughs> so many times. Two reasons. One is I could give them away when I had hosts, you know, it was just kind of a, this amazing little chocolate energy candy and fun. So some of my guides used to love my visits because I brought Oreos. But for me too, having that little infusion of chocolate with, of course, lots and lots of water was really life-saving because it is quite an effort. And the top of the trees is almost like a desert. It's very hot and dry and it's easy to get dehydrated and really hungry. I love, I just loved all of your stories. You have, I wish I could have included them in the book, all of the, you know, exciting and, and scary stories. So I wanted, and it's not in the book, but I'd love for you to share your scariest moment. Oh my gosh. Okay. When you, you know, I'm coming out with a sort of a high school and adult version of your book called The Arbor Not Nagus. So I hope I've encapsulated my scary stories in the next book that I'm writing. Uh, a couple things, of course, uh, one wasn't scary, but I wanted to see, of course, an anaconda in the Amazon because they scared me just in theory. And one of my guides one night, I said, you know, Guillermo, couldn't we see an anaconda? And he immediately left off the boat and pulled one out of the water. He'd seen this little bubble that just indicated there was one underwater. That shows you how brilliant and wise these guys are that grow up in that habitat. So that was fabulous. And it wasn't really scary. It was just exciting. Probably my scariest moment. This is quite funny and was in the forest of Panama. I was eating my lunch and all of a sudden I was surrounded by monkeys and they looked really angry and they started throwing branches at me. I think they smelled and wanted my sandwich. So of course I flung my sandwich away and they all scampered after it. But I didn't realize that probably our next relatives, right? The primates might like to eat our lunch occasionally. <laughs> But it wasn't too much to fear. I'm still more frightened to walk across the street of Fifth Avenue or a busy city in Boston than I am in the rainforest. It's usually pretty wonderful and safe down there. Well, I can't wait to see your book when it comes out. I, I, I have actually two of your other two books here. Oh, that's so Thank nice. You. Oh, great. These, are, these are Meg's other two. These are her autobiographies. I highly recommend them. Um, and Jana, I loved how you illustrated all the amazing animals. You did such an incredible job and I'm sure it was a lot of research for you to do that. But well, thank I was, you. I'm, I'm really looking forward to you talking about your process and how you brought so much richness to the illustrations and I can't wait to hear about it. So would you like to share a little bit about that? Sure, sure. <clears throat> well, the, the, the first part of my process was really um, learning more about Meg. Um, I had your manuscript um, and I was intrigued, so I wanted to learn more. So I'm going to go ahead and share um, some images of my process, if that's okay. I'm going to share my screen. Give me one second. Let's 
Sorry, I have quite a few. All right, I'm gonna just I'm gonna go here. <laughs> so the first, my first, uh, the first part of my process is um, after I did some reading about Mag, I go back to the manuscript and just start playing around with the actual text and laying it out. And this is a a sample um, selection of a two page spread from the book. And I have a rough idea of where I think the text will be. And so that's what that looks like. And then, then I start doing some very, very rough sketches, just little thumbnails of where I think things will be placed. And I start sort of working through um, how I think the story will flow with the pictures. So for instance, this picture I was, thinking maybe Meg's words would be in word balloons. I ended up not liking that, but so this is the, the process of how I work all these things out. Then the next step is I started doing some very rough sketches with color. Um, these were just meant for me, just sort of playing around and kind of getting the look of the book. And then the next uh, process was actually working up a sketch for everyone to take a look at and approve. Um, and this is when I started doing the research about the animals that actually live in the canopy and the region that the story is taking place in. So this is in Australia. So um, that was really fun. I had a lot of fun reading about everything that lives way up in the trees. Things I had no idea um, made their home there. And that was that was fascinating. Um, I ended up flipping the page. I wanted the text to be on the left side and Meg to be on the right. And then I started slowly adding color, some background color for this page um, and adding other elements. Now I'm adding, now I've got Meg and I've got some animals and I've got some berries and some flowers. And now we're getting close to the end. I'm just adding some more elements, some more leaves. And then this is what the end result is, the final stage of the illustration with um, all of the leaves, all of the animals, Meg and her tree, and some light um, streaming through the canopy. So exciting. <laughs> That, that, actually, that is my favorite illustration, I think. I was looking through the book to pick my favorite mm -hmm. so, so I can print it out and put it on my wall. And I think <laughs> that one might be my favorite. How about you, Meg? Did you have a favorite? Oh, gosh. I know I had so much trouble picking a favorite, but I have to say I'm going to cheat a little bit and pick two things. But I love the cover because I think that simple magnifying glass and the binoculars give the sense of a scientist and a curiosity. And of course, with all the birds and cool things that you can spend ages finding is very cool. <laughs> But I also love the night picture because that was, you know, you have this little tiny person, me, that you can hardly see who she is, but the headlamp. And then this amazing view of all those leaves with all those bugs on them. And, you know, that was such a seminal discovery for me that, holy cow, of course insects eat at night because they don't want to get eaten by birds by day. So <laughs> I just you know, was amazed that I ended up going to the bathroom at 2 a.m. and hearing them eat at night. So I just thought you did a really great job of conveying that beautiful scene. It was lovely, but all the pictures. Thank are you. Lovely. Thank I you. Also Thank love you. This one. I love yes, this one. I do too. There's my pet tarantula. I know. <laughs> Harriet, <laughs> darling Harriet. <laughs> my boys will be so thrilled to see that. <laughs> I know. That that's the level of detail which I love that you you put that in there. Meg's great. pet tarantula. That's great. <laughs> Thank you. I wanted it to feel like a real space. You know, she's home, but I knew from what I had read, because I had read oh. um Meg's autobiography as well. And um I couldn't believe that she could just be at home without bringing something back with her, <laughs> some sort of animal life in her house with her. So I was oh, like, 
Jana, Does May have, have a visit? pet of some sort? <laughs> so let's come to Florida. People bring their grandkids and kids to my house because they or my condo. They call it the museum. <laughs> <laughs> All of that. my archives. <laughs> I love that. I love that. Well, that, that was really cool, Jenna, to see your process. And it's all digital, right? It's all digital. It's all yeah, digital. It's amazing. Which makes this a little bit easier, being able to show the process actually yeah. makes it a little bit easier. But cool. yeah, amazing. so cool. Hmm. Thank you. Well, Kira, I think we should definitely let some other people ask questions. I don't want to hog all the questions. Absolutely, but I'm going to jump the line because, um, because Jana, I have a question about, um, I, one of the things that I love most about your illustrations is about the scale that mm -hmm. you have of, of Meg in the trees. Can you talk a little bit about how you achieved that so that we really do feel, you know, we, we feel the full scale and the, of the, of the trees versus the person and the little animals um, in all of your your pictures. That's such your a good question. That's such a good question. That was that was that's something I worked out early in the thumbnail um, stage of my illustrations because it's a biography of Meg. I wanted it, it seemed the the first thought is Meg front and center of every illustration, you know. And it quickly, it was like, I can't, I can't do that. It's, it's Meg's story, but I have to be almost seeing through her eyes and figuring out how to show that scale. So, you know, basically playing around with angles, how we're looking at the forest, how we're experiencing things. So we can, you know, there are a lot of like, the basically like the camera, the eye, is behind Meg, which doesn't seem ob an obvious way to do a biography, but was really necessary to be able to show the scale and to show the subject, which is, you know, also the story. Thank you for that. Thank you for letting me jump the line. Yeah, I just, that was <laughs> the big thing that I noticed. I loved that so much. <laughs> Thank um, you. I, I wanted to ask Heather, I, I noticed that you are donating the royalties of your book to, um, to the Tree Foundation. Um, can you explain what the foundation is um, and what projects are you are working on now? Go ahead, Meg, I'll let you take that one. Sounds good, Heather, thank you so much. So Tree Foundation is 20 years old. We founded it um, in the year 2000 to actually build a canopy walkway in Florida where kids had never seen anything because it's so flat. They'd never seen the top of a tree. They'd never seen a view be above the horizon. And we then funded all the kids in the school districts to go out on field trips to nature, which is another thing that kids weren't doing in public schools. So it evolved to be a foundation that fosters canopy projects and education of kids, especially girls. So now we distribute books, especially to girls in science. We do a lot of Zoom programs during COVID for kids around the country. And we basically are starting a new project I'm totally excited about called Mission Green, where we're going to be building canopy walkways with the help of some of the world's most famous scientists in the most highly biodiverse forests. Madagascar, Mozambique, India, Malaysia, all there are about 10 forests that are at the top of our list, thanks to the world's most famous biodiversity scientist, Professor Ed Wilson, who I might add added the back cover comment for Heather's book, along with our wonderful friend Jane Goodall, who's the primate expert. So she got fabulous reviews, and um, that was really exciting. So with Ed Wilson's help in a very, you know, small group of pretty well-known scientists, I've been able to earmark these forests and we're fundraising now to build these walkways, get women and families locally to operate the ecotourism components of the walkways so they won't be tempted to log their trees for short-term income. They'll be much happier with a sustainable income over many, many years of tourism. And then we hope also to fund student scholarships to go and explore the canopy because we also know that nothing has been discovered in any of the those countries um, as far as their 
your treetops. So it's a little bit ambitious, but we have to do it. Someone's got to do it. And of course, we need to do it in 10 years. And Heather's become a big fan of saving the forest because of her own exploration in the Amazon. So I'm totally grateful to her taking part of the proceeds to help with that cause. We're pretty excited. We just got the green light, Heather, from the National Parks of Madagascar and the U.S. Embassy there to design the walkway in Madagascar. And that needs to happen quickly. 95% of their forests are gone and it's the only home to lemurs, which are the cutest little things on the planet. So we might have to get you to Madagascar, Heather. <laughs> it's on my list actually. So. so that's the Tree Foundation in a nutshell, but you can go on our website, www.treefoundation.org and you will see what happens. We're very proud of the fact we own no real estate and we don't pay any full-time salary. So almost all of the funds people donate do go to the real deal, which is conservation of trees and education of girls and kids in science. Wow. Thank you for telling us all about that. And, and thank you for that. Thank you for your work. It's just so urgent. And, and thank you for reiterating that urgency for us over and over. We need to hear that over and over and over again. Um, I, I, there are so many questions here, so I'm, I'm going to dive in. And if, um, and if you have any lingering questions, audience, like this is the time um, as we, as we get going here. And, and Karen asked a question that I, I also would like to know the answer to. What do the numbers on the leaves represent? That was, that was talked about kind oh, of right. in the beginning of the book. Um, <laughs> and can you tell us more about what that was all about? Sure. So because I was returning every month to look at every branch that I wanted to measure and monitor the health, I started at the bottom of the branch, leaf number one, the top of the branch, say leaf number 10. So then next year when the bud expands again, I'd have leaves number 11, 12, 13, 14. So that allowed me to make data sheets and analyze the data over time because I would have leaf number one, in tree number one and height number three, and I'd be able to write it into a computer program so that I would know exactly how long each leaf lived. And I used very simple waterproof magic markers. I even had to do experiments in the beginning. This is highly anal and technical as scientists often are that I had to make sure that insects didn't wanna eat the ink or weren't affected by the ink. So I had to do a little experiments to make sure that it was a very uh, random thing that insects were not affected by the ink. So that was kind of my first step, but that helped me keep every leaf separate from each other, if that makes sense. This is so cool, knowing that they would, like, of course, insects would want to eat the ink. Did you, did you find <laughs> some insects that wanted to eat the ink? No, or did you? not at all. No. They want to oh, eat the leaf. God. They didn't even know, I guess, that there was ink. But, you know, and again, it's scientifically, you can make, you can do these little experiments to see if something's random or purposeful. And fortunately, it was random because otherwise I wouldn't have been able to put the ink on. So that would have made my, you know, study a little bit. I'd have to have a big challenge. How could I recognize a leaf every time if I didn't number it? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, fortunately, I didn't have to think about that. That is super cool. This is the coolest. Um, the next question is, is a really practical one and, and one very much for 2021. Has COVID affected your travels? Um, and, and when will you be able to go back into the field? No, absolutely. Yes, it has. It allowed me to finish my book, The Arbor Knot. So I'm excited, at least that it gave me that time to really think it through. In fact, you can order the pre copies on amazon.com now. So I'm glad that that stayed to schedule. Um, but with great disappointment, um, we have had to postpone this design trip to Madagascar to map the walkway out. We're hoping to go in May. And of course it postponed or delayed some of my work in Ethiopia where I'm really trying hard to um, help people there with forests and trees. So um, yes, the answer is absolutely yes. Things are on hold, but so is it in the countries. In other words, the loggers are on hold a little bit and, you know, the people are on hold a little bit. So we're all in this together and everybody's just hoping that we can resume where we left off with some of these important projects. There are two questions here about just like a, a, about outside um, interest in the rainforest. So I'm, I'm going to kind of combine the two. Um, so do you see um, that businesses sh are showing changed attitudes towards saving the rainforest um, simply as a timber resource? Like, is this, is this some sort of like other weird thing going on? Um, in Brazil and other rainforests, do farmers show any changed attitudes? 
Right. And that's a great question because, of course, people have to make money and they have to feed their families. And I mentioned I'm doing all these school talks or maybe I didn't, but every week I'm doing a lot of Zoom talks in schools around the country. And so I've engaged a friend of mine named Vic, who was a Wall Street trader and a really good financial expert, because I think we need to talk about the exploration and the discovery, which I do. But we also need to talk about how do you pay for conservation and how do we engage businessmen and, you know, his perspective is that absolutely they care as much about their kids and grandkids as do scientists but it is a matter of education it's a matter of getting something in front of them and helping a broader public understand the issues and I think that's really really important I used to tell my students when I was a college professor if you could design a Super Bowl ad to save the rainforest I'll try to help fund it but nobody ever got a good idea it's really hard to try to think of how do you convince people in 30 seconds or less this is really important to you and it's still a challenge but I do think we're doing a lot better let's face it the fires and disasters that we've seen are not good but they have given people a big wake-up call and I sure hope they don't forget about it quickly. So then on that note, um, uh, so Alistair writes, the musician Sting has long been a big proponent of saving the rainforest using a celebrity for fundraisers and awareness. Um, was uh, He is curious about what groups are driving the effort currently and are there any governments that are helping to take right. lead? Well, if he could introduce me to Sting, I would be so delighted. And Leonard DiCaprio too. It's all about connections, you know, and sometimes I think I should just move to Hollywood, although I couldn't afford to, um, because you do need to network with the people that can make a difference. I would love to have Heather and me get on it in Oprah's network or something <laughs> like that, you know, so that's a dream, but it is a matter of also, I think, seeking what I call diverse stakeholders. In other words, in Ethiopia, it's the priests who are the trusted leaders. And by my working with priests, I now have an amazing amount of trust with all the local communities, much more important than liaising with the government. And I think sometimes by throwing money at the governments of Brazil, we haven't really achieved much. So it's a real matter of finding out who is in the driver's seat. And sometimes it's quite different, maybe engaging sports teams, you know, who would it be that would have that ability to really get kids to listen, to get businesses to listen. And I think in a lot of cases, it's different in every country in every situation too. <laughs> I didn't unmute myself. Yes, this is, this is amazing. <laughs> I'm learning so much. Um, this next question is for you, Heather. I, um, a lot of your audience would love to know um, how you got this gig. Um, what inspired you to reach out to Dr. Lauman? Um, you know, what, you know, where did this kind of get started? Um, and, and how did you make this happen? Well, every book is kind of different. But for this one, I started with the idea that, you know, as I said, I'm passionate about our natural world and worried about what's happening to our rainforests. And so I started there. I decided I wanted to write a book that was a biography, but also a book about the rainforest. So it's more of a science book. And so I started with that and then just did a bunch of reading online at the library and then found Meg and that was the end of it. I knew she was my, she, I knew she was my woman. So I emailed her and luckily she responded. <laughs> Actually, you'd be amazed, like almost any time I email someone for, I want to write about them or I need their expertise, I almost always hear back. It's amazing. Scientists are so generous and they're always willing to help, especially with children's books. So yeah, so then we met in person and then eventually went to the, the rainforest together. It's really fun. Yeah, we become friends for a life, <laughs> not just through a book. <laughs> <laughs> That's wonderful. Can we, uh, there, there is a question about, uh, you know, have you been to the rainforest of which the answer is yes. So how did you experience the rainforest? And, and, and I asked this question as a, as a person who has not been and doesn't always like to be outside and even the bugs right outside my Massachusetts window freak me out. So can you talk <laughs> a little bit about your experience in the rainforest and the creepy crawlies and you know, all the wonderful things they're in? Well, it was just an incredible, a life-changing experience, honestly. And I'm also a little bit, you know, I don't really like snakes. And 
tarantulas I wasn't a big fan of, but I tell you, once you're there and you're surrounded by it, it's, you sort of get used to it. And I was, I was out there on these night walks where you couldn't really see anything except for what was in front of you with the headlamp. You could hear a lot because it's very noisy at night in the rainforest. And as you're scanning around, you're seeing tarantulas coming out of holes and little, you know, scorpions and snakes on leaves. And, you know, it was an amazing experience. It was a little unnerving at first, but then I, you know, I, I got used to it and was really able to appreciate. I think the thing that I came away with from that trip, other than all these amazing little things that Meg taught me, was how interconnected everything is from the little ants to the trees to humans and how um, important our rainforests are. So I, I came away with just a much larger understanding of, of the rainforests and what the purpose and functions of trees are and how everything is interconnected. Jana, did you get the opportunity to go to the rainforest? And I'm still, I just, tarantulas coming out of trees is just, mm -mm, uh -uh. <laughs> Jana, did you get to go? <laughs> I have, I have been. I, I, uh, I took a trip to Costa Rica. Unfortunately, not with Meg, but, <laughs> but I, I, I got to experience a little bit of what that's like. And it is pretty amazing. It is pretty amazing. It's pretty amazing. Giant crabs walking around the forest floor. That was the thing that creeped me, creeped me out the most, I think. Oh. I was like, crabs in the forest? That's crazy. <laughs> That's wonderful. Um, so can we just talk about, again, I'm going to skip the line up a little bit. So so Dr. Lauman, is, is there something that goes bump in the night in the rainforest of which even you, you're like, no, thank you? Like there has to be one thing, right? There's many more things in Boston. If that's where you live <laughs> or New York City, I'm sure that would scare the dickens out of me. Um, mostly it's fabulous. And of course, over time, I learned to recognize everything from a howler monkey to an owl calling to a, maybe if you're lucky, a jaguar roaring or something even bigger in some of the forests in Asia, like an elephant. Um, so it's all pretty good. Um, the only thing might be if you have a few of the locals that have had too much of their homegrown rum or something <laughs> but let's face it you have that in the streets of the city too so I find the sounds of the jungle fantastic there's no better way to go to sleep than surround sound frogs and birds and insects chewing leaves <laughs> cool 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 this is great I this is so great I'm still thinking about tarantulas in the in the hole <laughs> no <laughs> no let alone in the house not even going to talk about that okay um, more questions. Um, uh, this, this is a question for you, Jana. It's about, um, about the accuracy of your illustrations. Um, did, did, uh, were you able to consult with Dr. Lauman? Was there ever any questions about, you know, what went into something? Um, and, and if you got it right or, or was it completely on your own? How did, what, how was that part of your process? Well, the, uh, I received very specific, um, art direction, not with specific like insects and animals to include. So that I did the research on my own. And then um, when I submitted sketches to the publisher and who shared them with Heather and Meg, that's when I got feedback of, you know, yes, <laughs> these, these things do actually live in the place that you're, you're, uh, you're depicting or, or not. I think for the most part, I think I, I, I got them right. I think there may have been like one or two that I needed to change, but um, it's, I mean, the, the research was, again, it was just like a real joy to do, to take, to be able to take that time and just be reading endlessly and knew that this was, I had to do this. This was my job. <laughs> Don't disturb. She did a great job. I'm going to interrupt her and say, you Thank know, for you. example, the giant stingy tree leaves have the right kind of holes and they have the right kind of beetle on them and the coachwood bark is the right color. So it was oh, fantastic. <laughs> good, good. So uh, I, you were, I can't believe it, but this hour is, we are, we're up at this hour, but I just, I'm, I, if it's okay, if everybody can just stay for a couple more minutes, can we ask a few more questions? Is that okay? Sure, yeah. Okay, brilliant. 
Um, so there's there's someone in the audience who who has a question about motherhood and and uh, about about being a parent in the jungle. Um, are, would you? I mean, that's a personal question, but I'm just going to put no, it out there good. because you know we're all women on this panel and 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 doing really important work and also being moms, and I think that's really cool. Yeah. Um, so so if you're willing to, you know, what is that yeah. like? It's huge. And that's partly why I wrote this book that's coming out called The Arbor Knot to just really lay it on the line. Because obviously, that was a huge hurdle for most of my life working in a male dominated field and doing things that were a little bit physically rigorous and maybe scary at times. And my two boys were great sports. I owe so much to them for being willing experiments <laughs> and um, actually helpful. And a lot of times they saw the bugs before I did because they had better eyes at their age. So mm -hmm. there were a lot of things. It was always for me, the logistics of kid packing and kid organization plus research packing and research research organization, which none of my male counterparts ever had. So yes, it's a huge deal. And um, it's something that all women need to think about if they ever intend to juggle career and family or men. In some cases these days, maybe more men will be willing to do um, half of that juggling. Um, but I did, you know, spend some additional time talking about that in my own book, something that probably Heather doesn't intend for five-year-olds or 10-year-olds to be worried about that too early in life. <laughs> but it's if, whoever asked that question is very perceptive because it definitely was an issue for me, huge. Wow, this is, this is so important and amazing. Um, okay, just maybe two more questions. Um, the first is there was a mention uh, um, earlier that you, you ended up teaching blue collar workers for a little while. Was that in an effort of outreach or simply um, just a community class? And was there a lot of interest? Yes, it was a community class for Sydney uh, that, you know, there was a tech college or a community college and they were always asking graduate students to teach classes. And so I did it, A, because I could get a little additional income to pay for things because graduate students are always poor, let's face it. And B, I really did value that experience with those uh, getting in front of a, an audience and trying my best to overcome my own shyness and it helped me let's face it become a teacher and an educator at the same time so it was a really great experience I'm happy that I invested the time and energy to do that okay and then the last question and there's so many and I'm sorry we're not going to get to everything everyone um but uh, um the last question I want to ask and, and I think that it can go for all of y'all is, you know, aside of course from reading this book, do you have advice for parents to foster a sense of love and wonder about the natural world in young children? Well, absolutely. I guess I have to say it having been there, done that, and I'm sure the other two will agree, but I do think it's one of the most important things we can do. And maybe COVID has helped that a little bit because parents have done bird feeders or maybe they've watched leaves grow in the backyard because they couldn't do anything else. And if they haven't, start tomorrow, mom and dad, because I think there are so many things. Kids can look in a sidewalk crack and find something wonderful to discover and they don't really need to go to the rainforest canopy. And I see something on your window right now behind you, Kira, and it seems like it's crawling around. Oh, no, it's the fish in your tank. <laughs> but I'm seeing nature in your background. I'm so excited to discover it. Um, so I do think that's a critical, critical part of growing up. And I think parents everywhere can make that happen. Even if you want to grow mold in your fridge, you can do some <laughs> experiments. <laughs> so I'll pass it on to Heather and Janet to follow up. <laughs> no, I, I totally agree. And, and I think, I, I guess I was lucky when my kids were younger, it was before cell phones. And so they just, they couldn't wait to be outside. It wasn't like I had to make a point of it. At least they spent tons of time outside all year round. And we did lots of projects and, um, and we traveled too a little bit, but mostly it was just in your backyard or going up the street or going down to the park or, you know, going for a walk in the woods. and. So I think now today, parents have to be much more purposeful about it. I think they really do have to make that conscious choice because there's so many temptations that weren't there when my kids were young with, you know, so with electronics and, and um, cell phones and other things. So I think it does have to be a more purposeful decision. 
Yeah. Yeah, I agree. And I had this, I had the same situation. My, my, I raised, we raised our sons really before um, cell phones and it was just getting out, you know, and I think every child is naturally curious. So foster that curiosity and, you know, figure they're going to have questions about where, you know, where do bees go in winter and, you know, what what is eating that tree and why and, and find out it's so easy to to find out answers and it always feels like and I think I'm, my sons are 25 and we're still doing that and trying to figure it all out and make our backyard more of a, a wildlife habitat um so yeah it's easy to it's easy to um answer the questions now so just foster the the curiosity and the creativity I think and books are a great place to start too. Yes, definitely. Always. Definitely. Always. So, I, you know, this has been a really amazing hour. It's been so special. This has been a fabulous launch. Um, any just final thoughts uh, for your for your audience of which there are still, there are 70 people here. It's just wild. So any other just like closing wonderful things you want to say uh, well, before I, we go? I, I do. I want to say thank you to you, Kira, and to the Silver Unicorn. Like this is, you guys have done such a great job organizing this. And the other thing I want to say is that writing children's books, all books probably, um, is really a team project. And I think you can see, you know, there's three of us here that are part of the team, but there's so many more. And from my publisher, Boyd's Mills and Kane is my publisher, all the folks there, my editor, Carolyn Yoder, my critique group, all those people who gave me feedback along the way and, and helped me work things out. My family who supported me when I was going crazy, you know? So it's, it really is a, a big team project and requires so much teamwork. And so I guess that's the last thing I wanted to, to leave on. I guess I'll just say what I always say when I sign off on my emails, enjoy nature. I think for everybody, take your kids to the Amazon, maybe instead of Disney World, even though I live in Florida, <laughs> buy them a nice book like The Leaf Detective, maybe instead of a new video game. But um, at the end of the day, um, oh, my puppy just ate my stuffed water bear. <laughs> Never mind he, how he got on the counter and got all my little stuffed animals I was going to show. <laughs> Never mind. Um, but I do think it's important for, you know, it's still up to parents to give their kids exposure before they are in control. So just yeah. do and teachers too. And I take my head off to teachers during COVID because they have so many Big challenges. Time. Big time. And good for you guys if you can share this book and others. Thanks so much, Heather. What a privilege <laughs> to be part of Heather and Jana's world too. <laughs> yeah, thank you. I just wanted to thank everybody here and thank you for, I'm just really grateful to have been a part of the project. So oh, thank I'll you. I'll be starting to eat the book, Heather. I better go. <laughs> oh no. Okay, well then I guess that this is the time to say goodbye. Listen, friends. <laughs> Um, thank you so much, everyone. Thank you for coming. Thank you for choosing us for your launch. Friends, the silver, uh, the silver unicorn, the leaf detective. There's the puppy. puppy. There's the good puppy. Oh. 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 We've reached, exceeded our patience. Yes, I'll take her a walk. <laughs> <laughs> the leaf detective is available at the silver unicorn books, in, uh, at silverunicornbooks.com or at an independent bookstore near you. Pick it up. But if you want signed copies, you need to come to our website site make sure that you get a copy and don't forget that if you can please donate a copy of this book to the tree foundation so that even more kids can have an opportunity to experience this book just like you have today um thank you so much everyone stay safe and healthy out there um tune in for our upcoming events we're launching a brand new uh young adult book um by uh act and author nicole l'esperance next week um, next Tuesday at 7 p.m. So come see us for that and register on our website, silverunicornbooks.com. You can see the events um, menu or events page for all of our events. We've got events going on until June, y'all. So, so come see us again. Um, everyone stay safe in the COVID times, stay healthy, um, and take good care. And we'll see you again next time. Bye, y'all. Congratulations, Bye. Heather. Congratulations, y'all. Yes. You did a good job. Bye. <laughs>